If you're looking to stay informed with the latest analysis on the stories that are shaping our world in the areas of foreign policy, national security, and domestic politics, consider becoming a member of the DSR Network. With the DSR Network podcasts, stay ahead of the curve on global affairs. Each episode across our more than 10 shows features top experts, policymakers, and thought leaders who break down complex issues into digestible, engaging conversations. From breaking news to historical context, we cover the latest topics that matter most. Whether it's the intricacies of international diplomacy, the latest in national security strategies, or the dynamics of U.S. politics, the DSR Network has you covered. Members receive an ad-free listening experience, bonus content for virtually all of our shows, an invitation to join the DSR Slack community, enhanced show notes for select podcasts, and much more. Visit thedsrnetwork.com slash buy and enter code JULY2024 to receive 50% off the regular membership price for the first year or first month. That's thedsrnetwork.com slash buy and code JULY2024. Thank you very much for your support. This is the Daily Blast from the New Republic, produced and presented by the DSR Network. I'm your host, Greg Sargent. Yesterday, the Supreme Court handed down its shocking new ruling in the case involving Donald Trump's demand for absolute immunity from prosecution for crimes related to his insurrection attempt. The court gave Trump some of what he wanted, ruling that official acts stemming from the president's core constitutional powers have absolute immunity from prosecution after the presidency. Other official acts have presumed immunity, while personal or unofficial acts do not enjoy such protections. There's so much to unpack here that we're just going to dive straight into it with our guest, Richard Hassan, an election law expert who you've seen all over TV, I'm sure, and who regularly writes about Trump's attacks on democracy and the law. He's just published a new book called A Real Right to Vote. Rick, great to have you on today. It's great to be with you. I wish it were for some other reason. Uh, Yeah, don't we all? Before we get into the ruling, I just want to point out the political impact of it right up top. The high court kicked the case back to the district court to analyze whether the crimes Trump is accused of qualify for that presumed immunity. Uh, That means Trump's trial for January 6th related crimes absolutely will not start before the election. And if Trump wins, he can simply cancel this prosecution. Either way, as you wrote in Slate today, this is going to be one of Chief Justice John Roberts's legacies. Can you talk about this? Yeah, so the court said, contrary to what I think you and I were thinking, like, wow, this is moving too slowly. The court thought it was moving too quickly. The court said, oh, it was rushed in the lower courts. So they've created a test that is really fact intensive. And what that means is it's going to be months of briefing in the trial court, months of briefing in the court of appeals, and you get another shot at an interlocutory appeal that is before trial, come back to the Supreme Court potentially. If Trump is not elected president and this prosecution continues, I don't think the trial would happen for a year or two. Right. And the thing that the court has to do uh, fact finding on is determining whether the particular crimes alleged in the in Jack Smith's indictment uh, involve acts that um, that are immune under the new test. And we'll get to that in a second. The ruling itself, uh, John Roberts and the five other conservative justices granted absolute immunity from prosecution for any official act within a president's exclusive zone of constitutional authority. But then there's a second category of official act, which is given presumed immunity from prosecution. These are acts that don't fall within that exclusive zone of constitutional authority. But what that means, I think, is the government would have to rebut the presumption of immunity from prosecution by showing that prosecuting a president in these cases, for instance, these things Trump did related to January 6th, that this prosecution would not intrude on executive branch functions. 
Can you explain this distinction to us? Right. So there are certain things that are listed in the Constitution, like appointing ambassadors. That's you know kind of in the core function. The president is listed in the Constitution as the commander in chief. So if you know the president orders uh, some military operation, the court gave us an example from the Trump indictment of something that falls into that, which is talking to the Justice Department. You know, there's the allegation they talked to Jeffrey Clark about potentially claiming fraud in Georgia and using that as a basis to go for the election subversion. Absolutely immune. We're not even going to have a discussion about that. Then there's other stuff where it's not clear. So two examples the court gives. One is talking to Vice President Pence about his presiding over the counting of the Electoral College votes on January 6th. Where it's, well, this is a tough case. You're going to have to really look closely because when the vice president does this, he's sort of in the legislative branch, so we're not sure. And maybe he could talk to him about other stuff, but not giving advice. And then even the speeches that Trump gave on January 6th, which riled up the crowd and led to the insurrection, the court said, the, generally speaking, the president has a bully pulpit. And so he has presumptive immunity for any public statements that he makes. I don't know exactly how you overcome this presumption of immunity and how I think you're exactly right that you try and show that it wouldn't impair executive function to, to do this. How do you decide if this is campaign related versus official action? It's like there's no answer. The court says it's really context dependent, which just leaves room for lots and lots of debate and litigation. Right. And the courts are going to have to figure this out on a case by case basis, I gather. I, you you alluded to, to Trump's pressure on the Justice Department to try to get it to fabricate a rationale for him overturning the election. And talking to the Justice Department uh, is the exercise of a core official power. So, so what happens in a second Trump presidency? Let's say that uh, Trump orders DOJ to prosecute Liz Cheney without cause. He shared a meme on this just this week about how she should be prosecuted for treason. I mean, it's incredible that the GOP nominee would share such a thing, but that's where we are right now, right? Would Trump be violating a statute if he ordered that prosecution, baseless prosecution? And if so, wouldn't he enjoy absolute immunity from prosecution for it after his presidency? Well, so the first thing to say is let, let's underline the last words you just said after his presidency. The court drops a little footnote saying, you know, by the way, the DOJ has taken the position that a sitting president can never be prosecuted for, while, you know, while they're still president. So you're, are you talking when Trump is 83 after his he's <laughs> right. voluntarily left office after his second term? I mean, like hard to imagine any of this, but OK, um, then it's not as if he didn't violate the statute. He might have violated the statute, but have immunity from prosecution. Just like the government can commit a tort all the time, but the government has sovereign immunity, and so you can't sue the government unless the statute, you know, unless the statute waives that immunity. So Trump ha would have immunity from uh, such uh, actions, and it's even worse than what we've described, because even if the president is doing something in his unofficial capacity, if he does an official act in a way that helps to prove that it, what his motive is, say, then that would be inadmissible. You can't even point to the official act as proof of the motive for the unofficial act that doesn't get immunity. And here, Justice Barrett left the majority and said, well, I, don't, I wouldn't go that far. If I were the president's advisor and he said, like, what can I do without risking criminal liability? It's like, You've got wide berth. This is, I see this as a green light to Trump to do all kinds of things that I think before this decision, many people would have advised him, well, you know, after you leave office, this could really open you up to some charges. I want to ask you about that because one big thing that's a topic right now is, is the pardon power, which is of core presidential power, power to pardon. Um, so many people have wondered whether under the Supreme Court ruling, accepting a bribe to pardon someone would enjoy absolute immunity. What's your take on that? I think, the, so the court hedges a little bit in its language. It says, you know, this is the first time 
that we've addressed absolute immunity for criminal activities. And we can't figure out exactly what the parameters are. And I think that's why kind of there's this presumptive, this language about the presumption of immunity. And you may remember an oral argument. Uh, this was floated by Justice Alito. He said, you know, like there could be some things that are so out of bounds that that would not be subject to immunity. So I think the court has, the way it re has written this, it's left itself with the slightest bit of wiggle room to say that some of these actions, even though the pardon power is core power, that they could potentially be prosecuted. But of course, you'd never be able to point to the pardon as for part of proving the crime, because then you'd be admitting evidence of an official act. So I think in theory, the door is slightly open to going after this, but it's not open very widely. You can view, as I do, this opinion as setting up roadblock after roadblock for trying to prosecute a uh, pre former president for a crime. And I think the key point here, and this is the point I made in my slate piece, is that the danger that the majority sees is very different than the danger that I see. Right? The danger that I see is you have a president who tried to steal the last election and is going to be emboldened if he comes in to office again and he could act like an authoritarian. The danger that the Supreme Court sees is sometime down the line, I don't know, in 50 years or whenever, there's going to be a politically motivated prosecution of a president, and this might uh, affect the president's powers. It might cause other presidents to not fully exercise their powers out of fear that they could be prosecuted. So the court's worried about a hypothetical thing down the line. I'm worried about what we see before our eyes today. And we do see that before our eyes today. He's openly and explicitly threatening an authoritarian presidency. He's, he's saying that he will prosecute his enemies without cause. Um, and he's just essentially saying in every which way that he'll violate his oath of office. I mean, that's just happening right before our eyes, and the court doesn't seem to see that. Right. And one of the things that's really notable about the opinion is that there's no recognition that what is alleged here is so serious and such a threat to our democracy. And it's a consistent pattern. John Roberts has now written three opinions. One was a procurium, but we think he wrote it, meaning an unsigned opinion. There was the Trump versus Anderson case on the question of uh, whether Colorado could remove Trump from the ballot for participating in an insurrection. There was the Fisher case involving the January 6th uh, people who were invading the Capitol. And there's this case. In none of these cases does John Roberts even give a little word about the importance of democracy. And he knows how to do that in other cases. Either he's being obtuse or he's being disingenuous. It's really hard to understand how he could not see what you and I clearly see before us, which is an imminent threat to our democracy going forward. I mean, we saw January 6th happen. Um, in her dissent, Sonia Sotomayor says it would be immune from prosecution if a president, quote, orders the Navy's SEAL Team 6 to assassinate a political rival, close quote. Is that real? How real is that? Well, uh, you know, again, I would analogize to the pardon uh, uh, issue. Uh, you know, is there something you could point to that would be a crime that would not be connected to the official act? But I think Sotomayor is right. It'd be very hard to figure out how the prosecutor would go after this. Can you walk through that in a little detail? Like, like walk us through that. So give us a scenario. And Well, so the idea, the president is commander in chief. And that is one of the powers that's listed in the Constitution. So that probably qualifies as a core power that is subject to absolute immunity with, uh, you know, a slight bit of wiggle room. And, you know, what happens then? You know, the, the president's commander in chief says to a, the military chain of command, do this assassination. Where's the other crime, right, besides proving it through the official act? So unless there's some wiggle room in it's not really absolute immunity for things that are so beyond the pale, which is the idea that uh, uh, Justice Alito floated at oral argument back in this case in April, then I don't see how you get around it. And, the, you know, at the, near the end of the opinion, uh, Chief Justice Roberts goes after the dissent and says, you know, they're saying this is gloom and doom, and we're not saying that at all. 
And, you know, this is, this is relatively minor. Yet it never responds to the SEAL Team 6 hypothetical. You know, that, that's only mentioned in the dissent. So it's really hard to parse. The, the court does leave a few openings for itself, but I don't, I don't see how this is uh, anything but not giving the president all the powers of a king, but giving the president something like the immunity that a king in England would have enjoyed. And that immunity is great power. The message that the Supreme Court is sending is that it should be exceedingly difficult to impossible to charge a former president with a crime. Now, if this ruling came out 20 years ago, I don't think I'd be as worried because, you know, I wouldn't expect that the average person who gets elected president is going to be doing a lot of criming. But Trump is kind of like the stress test, like, you want to know how far this opinion goes? Just wait six months. We may find out, you know, because he is a norm breaker and he's going to get advice as to what his maximal power is. And so we may find out sooner rather than later how far these powers go. That's a really interesting point. I'd like to bear down on it a bit. What you're saying, if I understand you correctly, is that if Trump is elected, then he will acting on the advice. And let, let me just uh, interrupt myself to point out that right now his outside allies are busily drawing up lists of people who will carry out the most corrupt conceivable designs uh, that Trump comes up with, right? This is something that is now talked about in MAGA world among big MAGA players like Steve Bannon and Cash Patel. The test is, are you willing to go all the way with Trump? We want you. We want you to work for Trump if you're willing to do that. I mean, Bannon is like, you know, talking about how we need guarantees that there will be major uh, prosecutions of, Fauci, of Anthony Fauci and Liz Cheney and General Milley. And, and so we are going to have a test, right? Trump is going to take, if, if elected, he is going to take this new Supreme Court ruling and see what sort of crimes he can commit, right? Under the doctrine that's been created here. Do I have that right? Well, I'm not one to predict that Trump is going to commit crime or not commit crime. What I can say is that the opportunity for him to commit crime has been vastly expanded. And a lawyer who is giving honest advice as to what's likely to be prosecutable is going to have a very different thing to say than they would have said yesterday or the day before yesterday. Because this opinion creates wide berth for those who might come up to the line and potentially even cross the line in certain cases. So okay. what we normally rely upon as a, another check would be the impeachment power, would be removal from office, a political check. That, of course, didn't work out so well the last time. You remember when Trump was impeached the second time and it was time for the Senate to consider convicting uh, Mitch McConnell said, oh, leave it to the criminal law to deal with this. <laughs> well, that's now mostly off the table. So will there be the political will to use impeachment and removal? I, I certainly don't have any confidence in that should it come down to that. I mean, all the uh, all the anti-Trump Republicans have gotten purged and primaried out and, and they've been cast out of uh, the Republican Party. So no. Right. So yeah. And of course, if Republicans retained control of the House in uh, 2025, then there's going to be no impeachment because there would not be a majority that would impeach, I think, no matter what Trump does. Okay, so let's just sum this up, Rick. If Trump gets elected and he cancels all ongoing criminal prosecutions of himself and his lawyers advise him that he now has a much wider berth for certain acts that would have clearly been vulnerable to post-presidential criminal prosecution before he now can commit those with absolute impunity, do we have rule of law? I think this, this opinion does a lot of damage to the rule of law, right? So what does the rule of law mean? One of the things it means is that no person is above the law, that we all have to follow the same rules. And to the extent that when you give immunity, uh, it can serve certain values for example, protecting um, prosecutors from being sued by criminal defendants who are unhappy, right? So that helps. But when you go too far, 
and you let there be gross abuse, then you start impinging on the rule of law. And anytime you give someone special treatment, there's that risk. I think especially in the context that we're in right now, the court is worried about hypotheticals when we have a dire reality. And the court ignores that reality. And I would say this, you know, this idea came up with some of the, in the Trump hush money case, willful blindness. Like, you're deliberately closing your eyes to what's going on in front of you. You know, Trump was accused of potentially doing that with uh, violating campaign finance laws. I mean, I think here the Supreme Court is engaged in an act of willful blindness by ignoring what's actually going on, what the reality has been over the last, you know, four years. Well, Rick Hassan, thanks for those cheery thoughts. Uh, let's call it a day. Thanks again for coming on with us. Uh, it was great to talk to you, and hopefully we'll have something better to talk about next time. Folks, make sure to check out some great new content up at TNR.com. Garan Sranka Ruta argues that Joe Biden should resign and make Kamala Harris president right now. And Michael Tomaski points out that we really need Barack Obama to step up and lead in this situation. We'll see you all tomorrow. You've been listening to The Daily Blast with me, your host, Greg Sargent. The Daily Blast is a New Republic podcast and is produced by Riley Fessler and the DSR Network.